Well, Nahum, the prophecy of Nahum. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this evening. Lord, that you're, again, that you're here. Lord, that, that no matter what happens, we're still following after you. We look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. No man can lay claim to that. Only you can. And so tonight, we're going to continue to look to you. And we're going to do that in your word through the prophecy of Nahum. So open up this section of scripture, this prophecy to us, Lord, as your Holy Spirit teaches us and guides us. And Lord, I pray he would speak through me your words. Those words that you know that we need to hear, whether it's encouragement or conviction or exhortation, Lord, that you would lead us and guide us and we would be more like you. That we would increase more and more, abound more and more as you desire for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, the book of the prophecy of Nahum. Now, before we start reading, just a little bit of background info on Nahum. Um, It's a short prophecy. And like most of the other prophets, this is all we have of him. Um, Especially the minor prophets. There's... All we have in Scripture is these three chapters of Nahum. And actually, we know what his name means. His name means comforting which is not what you would expect when you read the prophecy. But um, one thing to note is God's message will always bring comfort to his people in some way or another. Well, one thing is about Nahum is we really don't know anything about him. (laughs) We don't know what his, if he was always a prophet or if he was like uh, Micah where he was, you know, a shepherd beforehand and then God called him we don't know anything about the guy. We know that he's there in verse 1. He's an Elkishite. But we don't know where Elk, where, where um, Elka is or Elkosh is. There's a lot of speculation, but no one knows. There's no other place in the Bible that mentions Nahum or a prophet of, um, from him. We also don't know the time period of it. We can't say oh, it was, you know, it was in this year because he doesn't mention a king like a lot of some of the other prophets like we'll say in the 15th year of the reign of king so and so and so we can kind of get a bearing of when he's saying this prophecy but that doesn't matter because in the end it's not about the man it's about the message it's not about who's saying it it's about what they're saying cuz the truth is the truth no matter who's saying it And lastly, the one thing we can say about this prophecy is that it's to the Ninevites of Assyria. So it's going into verse 1 of chapter 1. The burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and who reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place. And darkness will pursue his enemies. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. For while tangled like thorns and while drunken... Like drunkards, they shall be devoured like the stubble fully dried. From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are safe and likewise many, yet in this manner they, sh- they will be cut down. When he passes through, though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave, for you are vile. Behold, on the mountains, the feet who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace, 
O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Just right there in that last verse of chapter 15, we realize that Nahum's name means comforting. And when you read all the other verses, there's nothing comforting about those verses if you're an Assyrian, if you're a Ninevite. However, what does he say to the Lord's people, to Judah? Peace, keep your feast, perform your vow, perform your vows. You'll have peace now. And why is this? Well, it's, it's because there's going to be judgment on Nineveh. That's what Nahum is saying in this first chapter. Now, instead of listing out all of the horrible things the Ninevites had done, which we find in a lot of other prophecies, right? You, you, in fact, we saw that in Micah, where Micah really lists out all the things that the um, at the, that Israel and Judah had done, and all the reasons why judgment was coming. Well, here, instead of listing out all these things that um, the Ninevites had done, Nahum actually describes who God is. Quite interesting. It's always important to understand who God is. It will help us grow in our walk with Him and help us understand who we're supposed to be, right? Because as Christians, little Christ, we're supposed to be like Christ. We're supposed to act like him. That's why uh, I believe there's four gospels that describe who Christ was and what he did on this earth. Four examples for us to follow. And then throughout the New Testament, throughout the Bible, we see the nature of God. So we can see what our nature as his children are supposed to look like. And typically when we think about when you think about the attributes, think about the nature of God, you typically think of forgiveness, love, mercy, grace, kindness, long-suffering, salvation, joy, eternity with Him. And all of those things are great things about the Lord. But just as common yet misunderstood is His righteousness, His justice, His judgment. His holiness. Notice what he says in verse 2. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is the one who avenges. And those who sin, sin against him. They're his enemies. In fact, the New Testament tells us that before we met Christ... We were enemies of God. We were at enmity with God. And in fact, that's how God showed his love for us by dying for us while we were still his enemies. Not once we joined his side that he decided to die for us, but while we were still his enemies, he died for us. But why are we his enemies? Well, because we were working against his will. We were following our father, the devil, in sin. Sinning against the Lord, right? Like when Joseph in Genesis, when Potiphar's wife wants to sleep with him and he says, no, I couldn't do that to my master. But more importantly, I couldn't sin against God. Because every time we sin, we're not just sinning against ourselves or sinning against someone we're lying to or cheating or stealing from. But we're actually sinning against God, our creator. We're breaking His law, His commandments. And so God, as we're told here, He takes, He avenges. He takes vengeance. He reserves wrath. Now in verse 3, He's slow to anger and great in power, but He will not acquit the wicked. One great thing about the Lord is He is slow to anger. If he wasn't, none of us would be breathing right now. (laughs) In fact, all of us are here because of God's loving, long-suffering. And him being slow to anger. But even then, he's slow to anger, but that doesn't mean he won't get angry. We see in Genesis with the flood. There was a point where God said, 
their sin is, is too much now. It's reached this, the boiling point. Judgment has to come on the nation. And throughout, with all the judgments in the Old Testament and even the New, God gives them ample time to repent, ample time to return. But there comes a point when His justice and judgment will take place. And then when He describes God's power, when He describes, you know, because the Ninevites didn't worship God. They didn't know God, Jehovah. So imagine Nahum walking into the city of Nineveh and saying, God's going to judge you and He's going to do this and He's going to do that to you. And they say, well, who's God? Isn't God the God of Israel? Why doesn't he just bother with Israel? That'd be like if, if, one of, if a manager from another company came into your company and started like bossing you around. You're like, whoa, 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 you're not in charge here. That's what the Ninevites thought of God. He's, he's the God of Israel, but not the God of the Ninevites, not of the Assyrians. We have our gods, Ishtar and the Ashdod and all these other crazy gods, images, idols. So Nahum actually is going to describe here in this first chapter, he describes that God is not just some local God. And this judgment is even going to be just this local thing that will happen in Nineveh, but he's showing God's universal power. See, the Assyrians with their gods, they were known to worship gods that were localized, right? You had the God of the sea. You had the God of the hills. You had the God of the valley. You had the God of the skies and the heavens, the God of war, the God of peace, the God of fertility, the God of drunkenness and partying and happiness and joy. All these different gods for all these different things. And so, you know, if you were fighting a battle in a hilly area, well, forget all the other gods. Let's just worship the God of the hills and he'll help us out. Or maybe you were in war and you wanted peace. Well, let's worship the God of peace. Maybe they'll help us out. But Nahum is showing that God is ruler over all people and all lands, right? The Lord, in verse, end of verse 3, the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and the storm. The clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The flower of Lebanon wilts. He's talking about all these different countries, all these different places and regions the mountains quake the hills melt the earth heaves yes the world and all who dwell in it just because the assyrians were not the people of god they were still his creation and they still had to answer to him they still had to answer to him In fact, we have the same issue today, right? There's many people who think that the only people that are going to be judged by God are those who follow God. They think, well, only believers have to answer to God because that's the God they choose to follow. But they don't understand common what it means when, it, when He creates us He's given us a purpose and we have to live for that purpose. We have to answer to our creator. Not just the ones who decide to worship him. But we all will. But as he mentions, I mean, even for us as believers, if that was just the case, we'd all be doomed, right? But notice verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who... Trust in Him. A slight glimmer of hope. Again, Nahum means comforting. So he throws a little comforting words in here for those who trust in the Lord. If you trust in Him, He will be a stronghold to you. And the Ninevites actually should have understood this because of the repentance that they saw before with the prophet Jonah. Remember, Jonah goes to Nineveh. He preaches a pretty simple message. Not a whole prophecy like we have here. 
His message is very simple, that the you know, Lord's judgment is coming. But what happens? The Ninevites repent. And the Lord relents from that wrath. Now, that generation must have passed away, and the sin started rising up again, and the Lord's back with the judgment, with the same call to repentance. But instead... Verses 9 through 14. Instead, they try to fight against the Lord. Instead, they try to combat the Lord. Or as Jesus said to Paul on the road to Damascus, why are you kicking against the goads? You know, there are many out there who think that, um, again, if they're not worshiping the Lord, they're not acknowledging the Lord, that they have no problem with the Lord and the Lord has no problem with them. You know, I'm not some athe- militant atheist out there denouncing the Lord. I just choose not to live for Him. And Jesus says, if you're either for me or you're against me, there's no in between. You're either living for me or you're living for yourself. And if you're living for yourself, then you're an enemy of the Lord. And so instead, they try and fight against the Lord, and as a battle you'll never win. And no matter their strengths or numbers, they cannot withstand the Lord. What's interesting is Jesus says in Matthew 21, verse 44, speaking of himself as the stone, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken in a good way. They'll be humbled, they'll be saved, but... On whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. It will grind him to powder. You will never be able to withstand the Lord. You can only surrender to him and he'll save you. Chapter 2. He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emperors have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches. In the day of his preparation and the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to her walls. And the defense is prepared. The gates of the rivers are opened. And the palace is dissolved. It is decreed. She shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up. And her maidservants shall lead her as the voice of doves. Beating their breasts. Though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water. Now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry. But no one turns back. Take spoil of silver. Take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side, and all their faces are drained of color. Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion walked, the lioness and the lion's cub, and no one made them afraid. The lion tore in pieces enough for his cubs, killed for his lionesses, filled his caves with prey and his dens with flesh. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. Now, Nahum is now describing the destruction of Nineveh. First, he warns them in chapter 1 of who God is and the destruction that's coming. And now he's describing what that destruction's actually going to look like. It's not going to be a little slap on the wrist. It's not going to be a, you know, a stern talking to. It's going to be complete and utter destruction. And I think what's important to note about this section, what Nahum points out here, is that the things that they trusted in were the things that the Lord destroyed and went after. Their big army, their chariots, their strong men, 
or as he compares it here, the lions and lionesses, how the lion, speaking of the Assyrian army, would go out and just devour and, and, ha- and have prey to, to anyone they came across. But instead, those things would be destroyed. It wasn't going to be something else. It was going to be the things they trusted in. The Lord was going to show them how weak they were. And you know, the same thing goes for us. There's so many things in our life that we trust in. I mean, I talked about before, and we're trusting in this election. You know, some people are, 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 they are bent on just, if this person wins, everything will be fine and we'll all be saved. Saved from what? I think the more that we press into these things, like politics, and we have to have a Christian in power, we have to have this, we have to have that, I think the more we press into that instead of pressing into the Lord, the Lord's going to show us how weak those things are. Be careful. Be careful that you don't put good things in front of the Lord. And my family, or my job, I, I got to do these things. Jesus says that no one is fit to follow him who, who pushes the plow and looks back to be his disciple. When another someone else comes up to him and says, "Hey, Jesus, I want to follow after you, but you know, first let me like take care of my family and do these things." You know, let me bury my parents. Let the dead bury their dead is what Jesus says. Seek me first. But the problem is, is we're so distracted by other, and, and again, good things, right? There's nothing wrong with an education, except when that's your hope. Let me get this certificate, this thing that says that I've accomplished something. Then the Lord can use me. A family. The Lord calls us to take care of our families, to be there for our families, to love our families. But when we make those things idols, such as our kids or, or even our parents or our spouse, those things will fall, those things will crumble. Your career. Hey, as Christians, we should be the best workers at our job. Shining lights, great examples of a follower of Jesus Christ. But that's not our hope. Our hope isn't that that company stock skyrockets so we can make more money. But our hope is Jesus Christ. And when we start putting our trust in those things, the Lord will show us how weak those things are. So be careful. Be careful what you're building on. Because trials and tribulations will come. We've talked about that in 1 Thessalonians. Persecutions will come. And if your family or your job or politics or a hobby or whatever is your hope, those things will crumble. So the same thing will go for us, that the things that we trust in, the things that make us not need the Lord will be shaken. Those things will take, be taken down. They will always fail. But as Nahum said in the first chapter, verse 7, we must trust in Him to be our stronghold. Those who trust in Him, He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And so the Lord, and so Nahum tells the Ninevites here that, that they're going to be empty, they're going to be desolate. You know, Nineveh was a place that everyone would go. Now, now people are running from it. This is the Lord's judgment. Now, chapter 3. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. Horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. 
They stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face, I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Are you better than Noaman that was situated by the river? that had the waters around her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was boundless. Put and Lubum were your helpers. Yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed to pieces. At the head of every street they cast lots for honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunk. You will be hidden. You also will seek refuge from the enemy. All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Surely your people in your midst are women. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. Draw your water for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go into the clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will eat you up like a locust. Make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locusts. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. Your commanders are like swarming locusts and your generals like great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges on a cold day. And when the sun rises, they flee away and the place where they are is not known. Your shepherds slumber. O king of Assyria, your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains, and no one gathers them. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? So now... Nahum opens up the prophecy a little bit. Now, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, the strength of Assyria. But he kind of opens it up and says, Assyria is going to be like this. And not just Assyria, not just Nineveh, but all the things that they have influenced, right? It's interesting nowadays when a city is bombed or attacked just in Europe last week, there was a couple terrorist attacks. And what do we do in, in our digital age? We, we throw out a hashtag. We throw out a new filter on our photos. You know, pray for wherever. People are, are rooting for that city to, to come back. But notice what God na- says here through Nahum. That the people will clap over your destruction. They'll be glad that you're destroyed. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? And what he says here is that Nineveh will be completely demolished. Completely. In fact, for centuries, Nineveh was actually a sharp uh, critique in the Bible. A lot of Bible critics pointed to Nineveh to say, look it, you have these great stories of Jonah and Nahum, and Jesus even says about Nineveh. But where is it? They never found Nineveh. They didn't know where it was. It wasn't until the 1800s that an archaeologist accidentally stumbled upon it in modern day Iraq but for centuries it was completely and utterly destroyed no one knew where it was because of all of its harlotries all of its sorceries as Nahum says and quite frankly this is the end of all those that are enemies of the Lord they will meet the Lord and he will judge them And his judgment will be righteous. See, all the things that Nineveh has done is coming upon them now. Nineveh will be taken. All the things that they influence will be taken. And and in fact, this is a comfort for us as believers. Because there will be one day 
when Jesus comes back. When he will take all those things away. All the sin, all the struggles, the influence of Satan in his world order. There will be no more influence or remembrance of those things. And that is the future that we look to. That's the kingdom that we look for. Now in closing tonight, I think this book has a twofold meaning for us. As a group of people, just like the nation, the city of Nineveh, we must remember that the only place we can put our trust in is in the Lord. Our Western culture, I think, puts too much trust in things that always fail, right? Constantly. Putting trust in things that are just going to one day crumble, that have crumbled. But, as a nation, we should know as believers, He is our stronghold. He can do to America what He did to Nineveh, unfortunately. And there's nothing protecting us from that judgment. Unless we turn to Him. The second application is to us personally. If we're not trusting in the Lord as our stronghold, the things that we will be trusting will be shaken and turned and brought low and shown how weak they are. But if our hope and faith are in Jesus Christ, He will be our stronghold in time of trouble. So let's pray. Lord, I thank You so much just for all You're doing, Lord that you are our hope, you're our stronghold, you're our strength. Lord, that no matter what we're going through, you will be there with us in the storm, when the, the, the waves are raging. No matter who is in office, Lord, you are on the throne. That no one can have authority or power unless it's given to them by you. We think that we're the ones who put people in power. Lord, it's you. Lord, I pray that as we see what happened to Nineveh and what happened to Assyria, that as Americans, as, as the church, we wouldn't look there and say, oh, that was a nice history lesson. But we would realize that this same thing can happen to us if we decide to put our hope and trust in things that are not you. That if we allow our sins to run rampant, these things can happen to us. Lord, I pray for us personally. Lord, the things that are are weak in our lives that we are putting our trust in, shake those things. Lord, like Nahum said, it's it's like a, a fig tree with ripe figs. When they're shaken, they just fall to the ground. Lord, but those who trust in you will be like a tree planted by the waters. in season it will have bear fruit it will have all the nutrients nutrients it needs and so Lord I pray we would be planted in you Lord be with us this evening the rest of this week Lord help us to be a people that have hope we have the hope let us live like it Lord because as we can see in our nation People are without hope. They are depending on a certain person to win. If that person doesn't win, oh no, there's no more hope, Lord. But we always have hope if we have you. So Lord, let us be the people that are looking to you for our hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well.